Welcome to today's Arctic Research Seminar, which is hosted by the Arctic Research Consortium of the United States, or ARCUS. Today's team includes Stacy Stout and myself, Betsy turner bogren Our seminar, which is entitled Stressors of Arctic Ocean Ecosystems, Improved Understanding of Primary Production and Ocean Acidification, will be presented by Dr. Jens Tahar, a postdoctoral fellow in the Division of Climate and Environmental Physics at the Physics Institute of the University of Bern. A link to an online survey will be available at the end of today's webinar. We'd appreciate your feedback as well as suggestions for future webinar topics. We have a couple housekeeping items before our presentation begins. Next slide, please, Stacy. You have two viewing options available today, gallery view and speaker view. Speaker view allows you to view only the presenter's cam webcam and presentations. Gallery view allows you to see the webcams of other participants online. To switch between those views, use the button in the upper right hand corner, which is indicated by the red arrow on the slide. Zoom controls, including chat, can be found by hovering your mouse over the bottom of your Zoom window. Next slide, please, Stacey. You are invited to chat with other webinar participants at any time. To do that, chat the, uh, click the chat slide icon at the bottom of the screen and select the name of the participant with whom you wish to chat. There's also an option to chat with everyone participating in the webinar, and that's how you'll ask questions. Questions will be addressed during the question and answer session following the presentation. If you are joining by Zoom, please type your questions as they come up into the chat window at any time, and I will read them aloud to everyone during the Q&A. If you are joining by phone, you will need to raise your hand by pressing star nine and unmute yourself by pressing star six to ask your question aloud. I'll give you a reminder of these guidelines before we start the Q&A. For any technical problems today, please contact Stacy Stout via email. That is Stacy, S-T-A-C-E-Y at arcus.org. Before we begin, next slide, please. We would like to thank the National Science Foundation Office of Polar Programs for their financial support to Arcus and to this seminar series. And next slide, please. Now we'd like to welcome our speaker. Dr. Jens Tahar is a postdoctoral fellow in the Division of Climate and Environmental Physics at the Physics Institute at the University of Bern in Switzerland, and is affiliated to the Osher Center for Climate Change Research in Bern. Dr. Tahar is currently studying the future of ocean carbon and heat uptake with a special focus on the Southern Ocean and is developing an adaptive approach that allows, to, allows us to reach the temperature goals of the Paris Agreement by determining the necessary greenhouse gas reductions at every stock take, solely based on past observations and not projections. Before he started his postdoctoral work in Bern, he had a short-term postdoctoral contract at the École Normale Supérieure in Paris, France to develop an emergent constraint on the Arctic Ocean acidification. Dr. Tahar completed his PhD at the Institute of Pierre-Simon Laplace in France and the University of Libre in Brussels, Belgium. During the PhD, Dr. Tahar studied the impact of terrigenous carbon and nutrients on the Arctic Ocean. He completed a Master's of Science in Physics at the University of Heidelberg in Germany and a Master of Science in Water, Air Pollution, and energy at local and regional scales at Ecole Polytechnique in Paris, France. During his studies, he had research internships at Woods Hole in the United States, National Oceanographic Center in Southampton, United Kingdom, and the Laboratoire de Oceanographie in Climatology in France. His research is supported by the Swiss National Science Foundation and the European Union Project Climate Carbon Interactions in the Current Century. Please join me in welcoming our speaker, Dr. Jens Tahar. Dr. Har? Take it from here. Thank you very much for the introduction. It's an honor to be able to speak here in front of all of you. And thank you very much for coming to, to this presentation. As uh, was just said, I'm speaking today about the stresses of the Arctic Ocean ecosystem and especially improved understanding of primary production and ocean acidification. This work presents most of my PhD work and uh, parts of my postdoc work. And I'm just starting uh, very general and I hope that, you, that I explain all the words that I'm using, uh, that I'm well used to as an ocean biogeochemist. If you have any questions about definitions of acronyms that I'm using without introducing, please just put them into the chat so that we can clarify that early enough and you don't get lost during the presentation. So, so, so we just said very uh, uh, 
general with things you you all know so the arctic ocean it's uh, for me it's more less i see it as the top of the world from a northern european perspective and the arctic ocean is very special compared to other parts of the global ocean as as you know it's almost entirely encircled by land it's connected to the other oceans only via narrow passages and not via the southern ocean with a acc around it and if you look on the Arctic Ocean, you see that the shelf seas make up almost 50% of the Arctic Ocean basin. So it's it's not everywhere a deep ocean like the most parts of the global ocean, but the coastal ocean is uh, taking up a large part of the area, and that's very important. In addition, with climate change, the Arctic uh, Ocean is heating much faster, or the Arctic itself is heating much faster than the global uh, than the global Earth. And what we can see here, the temperature time series, the global temperature time series and the one in the Arctic, and we see that climate change is amplified in the Arctic. And this leads to strong reductions in sea ice cover, for example, what you see here in February. So the maximum extent is re reducing over time and uh, the summer extent, so the minimal extent is reducing strongly over time as well which you see on the map quite quite obvious so large parts of the arctic and summer are ice free now and this then brings us directly to ocean biogeochemistry this affects then the primary production what we see here is observational estimates of the arctic ocean at primary production where you see black you don't see you don't have observations because uh, the sea ice blocks uh, the, the satellite images and we see that the Arctic primary production is mainly uh, at the coastlines close to the land. And due to a reduction in sea ice cover and climate change, the NPP's net primary production has increased by 57% uh, over the last, almost the last 20 years. So large changes are going on in net primary production, which in the Arctic is limited not only by nutrients, but also by light, especially in winter. And what makes the Arctic different is the large shelf seas and the food chain here, it's a simplified views, can be very short in the Arctic. So mammals like walruses almost, uh, can directly feed on, on benthos and zoo and phytoplankton, whereas in other parts of the ocean, the, the chain is, is longer and not as short as here in the Arctic. So changes in that primary production can directly affect a lot of animals or uh, li organisms living in the Arctic Ocean. And on top of that, it's very un a very unique ecosystem. With some mammals that exist or organisms that exist nowhere else, which makes it just uh, very special and interesting to study. But the ecosystems are not only changed due to increasing primary production. It's also that the Arctic Ocean is especially vulnerable to ocean acidification, a process that can be described by the reduction in carbonate ions or carbonate, uh, calcium carbonate saturation states. So what you see here is the surface carbonate ion uh, concentration in, in, the, uh, in the ocean and in the tropics here in red and uh, Southern Ocean blue and Arctic and, and green and the reduction or projected reduction over time. And at some point when the uh, carbonate ion concentration becomes too low, so if it uh, goes below the thresholds for the arrogonite and calcite saturations, which are two calcium carbonate minerals. The organisms that use these minerals, they lose their shells or their, their skeletons get dissolved. So this is uh, basically threatening um, important organisms in the food chain and then other animals that depend on them. And we already see today, if we go in the coastal regions here on the lab tests here in a study from uh, 2016, that large parts of the coastal shelves are already observed to be undersaturated. So this is the saturation state for aragonite, which is marked as omega aragonite. And it's already far below one. So one means saturation and below one is undersaturation, above one is supersaturation. And we see large parts are already undersaturated. So the surface ocean is already very much undersaturated here. But if we go into the deeper ocean, we see here in blue is supersaturated and red is undersaturated. And the red line is uh, the black line is where it goes from under to supersaturated. We see that a large part of the Arctic Ocean below the surface is still supersaturated. 
And in yellow, you see an estimate of the pre-industrial such a line where the black line was in pre-industrial states. We see that small changes have happened so far, but larger changes are projected over the 21st century, which I will come to later. And if you then look to model studies, what they tell us about these changes, we see that models have, uh, have very uncertain projections in the Arctic Ocean, or at least the range of projections, depending on the model that is used, are, are large. So for the Arctic Ocean, no summer sea ice is projected to be left between 2021 and 43. By SEMA 5 models, even worse are projections of NPP, the projected change, or worse, the the range is larger. So the projected change goes from my, a reduction of minus 25% to an increase of 60%. So we don't even know the sign of change. Depends. So with light uh, availability increasing, it's supposed that it's assumed that it's increasing what we're seeing now. But then in the ocean gets more stratified and the nutrient supply might reduce and then a possible decrease comes in. And what really dominates is depending on the model. And as well, the surface saturation state of aragonite in 2075 in this paper is shown to vary between 0 0.5 and 0 0.8 which makes a large difference for organisms that may adapt to saturation states slightly below one so to a small under saturation but come to to higher under saturation and this is why we ask the question how can we improve these projections or can we use the models to get a better idea of how the future will evolve. And to understand that, we first have to find the reason why the models diverge. And the large part is due just to the ocean physics. So if we look at the Arctic Ocean, it's a very complex circulation with inflowing waters from, from the Atlantic here through the Fram Strait and through the Barents Sea opening, which sink then into the deep basins and have a circulation here and sometimes go into another basin. It's very small scale circulations. And then we have the bigger surface circulation and the transpolar drift and water coming in from the Pacific. And for global models, Earth system models, it's just very complicated to resolve their rather cross uh, resolution, these small scale processes, which makes projections even more difficult if the physical circulation is already not well represented. And if we look at this in some more detail, we see, for example, here the annual sea surface density in the Arctic Ocean. On the left side, you see the World Ocean Atlas estimate. And on the right side, you see the model in the CMIP 5. So the older generation of Earth system models, the lowest or the smallest density. And then here you see the highest density. And we already see that it's a wide range of densities at the surface. And one is very much below the World Ocean Atlas, and one is very much above, say, this, these models uh, have difficulties already to get the present state right. And if you, for example, look at the core of the Atlantic water that flows in through Fram Strait, it varies between a depth of 250 meters or 1,000 meters. Its temperature varies between minus 1.5 to plus 3 degrees, which makes a large difference for, for the sea ice above these waters. And if you look for the carbon cycle, then we have the lateral inflow of anthropogenic carbon, which varies from actually not an inflow from uh, the Pacific into the Atlantic, but an outflow in some models to, to, an, to a strong inflow in other models. So the diff uh, difficulty in resolving the physics lead also the difficulties in resolving the carbon cycle and the biogeochemistry. And what I just said before, the primary production projections are also very different. And here you can see the increase in almost all models. Here are three representative ones. But then some models have a large decrease and some have an increase. So in this talk, I want to answer basically two questions. Can we improve ocean acidification projections in the Arctic? And how important is river and nutrient delivery and nutrient delivery from coastal erosion for the Arctic Ocean net primary production? Which then helps to see how, how good the future projections may be. So first, to start with the Arctic Ocean acidification, we can look at the bare model output. And Arctic Ocean acidification is mainly driven by anthropogenic carbon uptake. And we already see that the different models here from the CMO5 ensemble simulate a very different change in the Arctic Ocean anthropogenic carbon, so C and for anthropogenic carbon inventory, with large increases and uh, some models with very small increases 
and the vertical profiles also look very different. And that translates directly into very different projections of basin wide average Arctic Ocean aragonite saturation states, which can reduce to 0 0.65 or can remain very close to one depending on the model. So the question arises, which of these models or are there models that are better than others? Or can we have a, can we find a way to to know better where where we are heading under current current scenarios? And uh, this is all under RCP 8.5, but I will go to to other scenarios later on. So this is the high emission scenario. And uh, indeed, we found a way to to have a better idea of what how the future could look like. And we found that the maximum sea surface density, so what I showed you before, these three plots you have seen just before, relate very well to the uptake of anthropogenic carbon. So here you see the uh, future, the anthropogenic carbon inventory per square meter in the Arctic Ocean for the model with low density. Uh, so there's almost nothing. And for the model with the high density, there's a lot in this deeper basins in the Nansen Basin or in even the Canadian Basin. And the mechanism that is behind this is that the densest waters I've found here, so this is the, the areas where the 95 percentile of the densest waters for so the 5 percent densest waters are found. And these ones, they sink here and through the St. Anna Thruff into the deeper basins and take the anthropogenic carbon from the Atlantic with it. And in this model, we see that it's not well defined, the, the, the area, it's not only the Barents Sea. And it's so, the densities are so small that the water basically can't sink into the deep basins and no, almost no anthropogenic carbon can accumulate there. And if we then just plot these average densities in these 5% highest waters, we get a very nice linear relationship to the anthropogenic carbon uptake. So here you see the models with the lower densities or lower maximum densities, they take up little anthropogenic carbon and you have models with higher densities, they take up a lot of anthropogenic carbon. And then what we can do or what we did is we used observations of these densities from the World Ocean Atlas, which are marked here in, in black with the uncertainties. And the idea is that this relationship that we identified across the whole model ens ensemble holds then as well for reality so that in, if the observations are here, the best estimate for the anthropogenic carbon uptake would actually be on this line. And the uncertainties come from a convolution around the two uh, distribution functions, so PDFs, the one here that has a maximum here and then one sigma here and the observations. And then you get circuits around and can project them on the y-axis. And the result is seen here. So before, if you just take the mean over the models and the standard deviation, you get this prior distribution. Once you constrain it with observations using this relationship between density and anthropogenic carbon inventory, that's also based on a lot of observational studies, not the quant uh, qual quantitative relationship, but the qualitative, the fact that uh, barren sea waters are transporting a lot of anthropogenic carbon in the deeper Arctic, you get not only a better estimate or increased estimate of the anthropogenic carbon uptake, you also get lower uncertainties or the range of possible future values becomes uh, narrower than, than it was before in the, just in the unconstrained ensemble. And because anthropogenic carbon is responsible to a large part for ocean acidification, we did the same for aragonite saturation states. And what we find is basically the inverse relationship because more anthropogenic carbon here means higher saturation states. So the, it turns from a positive correlation to a negative one, uh, positive uh, relationship to a negative one. And uh, then we can do exactly the same, meaning uh, using the density anomaly in the, uh, from the observations and getting a better estimate or constrained estimate of the future saturation state, which means that uh, actually the models over or underestimated the future acidification, ocean acidification in the Arctic Ocean, with uh, which could have uh, implications for the ecosystems and uh, and the whole Arctic Ocean in total. And then remains uh, we wanted as well to know which regions the constraint or which depth the constraint works best. So we divided the Arctic Ocean into depth layers which you can see here. And then the black line again is the multimodal mean with the standard deviation at each depth layer. And the black 
dots show the constraint estimate. And what we see is that at the surface, the estimates are almost, or the uncertainty is not at all reduced. And in the very deep ocean, uh, it's not reduced either. The biggest reductions really happen in this mesopelagic uh, zone between below 500 meters and up to 1,000 or 1,500 meters. And this is exactly the zone where, they, where the water from the Barents Sea ends up and where the anthropogenic carbon is transported to. So this fits very well to, to our mechanistic explanation. Basically shows that uh, especially these waters uh, will experience much higher ocean acidification than previously expected. And uh, even a probability for calcite under saturation under the RCP 8.5 scenarios is now more likely. What we did then is we, when the new ensemble of climb, uh, of simulations from new climate models was available, so CMAP6, we repeated the same analysis using CMAP6 models. And we found some, some interesting results that, uh, that I want to share with you here, and they are published in Biogeoscience. So this is a little bit messy, the plot. I'm, I'm sorry for that. But um, here you see the different scenarios, what I said earlier. So we have SSP 585, the high emission scenario, and then the still high, but not very high, intermediate and low emission scenarios. And the RCP 8.5 is the one from, from the uh, CMAP 5, so from the earlier models. We here rescaled them all to atmospheric and, uh, carbon concentration from, from 585 to, to compare them. And we see that the line for the RCP 8.5, so the linear relationship between density and anthropogenic carbon is very different to the ones that we find in the new ensemble, which uh, poses the question if actually this relationship is really, um, uh, if it really exists or if it's just uh, randomly occurring due to, due to, uh, due to any random uh, possibility. But what we found is that the relationship is not random, but that it's actually not linear if you go to densities that are too low, meaning that once the surface density get below a certain threshold, then no water or almost no water is transported into the below the surface ocean. And the accumulation is only restricted to the surface or just below the surface, the first 100 or 200 meters. And then it doesn't, the whole mechanistic explanation doesn't make sense anymore. And indeed, if we take these three models out that are under a threshold that lies somewhere here in between, we get a relationship that's here that is very similar to the relationships of the different scenarios of the CMM6 models. And here you can see it as well zoomed into this, uh, into the different models where they, they are all scattered around. And uh, here you see the old line. And uh, by chance, by pure chance, the two lines, the old one using these models and the new one and excluding them because they, they have two low densities, they, uh, they cross the observations at exactly the same point. So the constraint estimate is still the same, even if we exclude them or don't exclude them. But we see that the relationship holds and that there's a reason why these ones are not on the same linear line anymore. And if we then use this uh, this relationship here for the uh, SF for the CM6 models, we can constrain the uh, the anthropogenic carbon in these under these scenarios as well, which I want to show you here. So on the left side, you have the time series, just the pure multimodal output of the standard deviation. You see at the end of the 21st century, the projections for this for the high emission scenario overlap even with the uh, projections of the intermediates of the 4.5 scenario and are very close to the low emission scenarios. So basically, if we don't constrain the projections, we don't really know how the future anthropogenic carbon uptake in the Arctic looks like. Whereas after the constraints, we see that the uncertainties in the time series, for example, this one gets, gets much reduced. And now the uncertainties of the high emission and the intermediate emission barely touch. And the low emission scenario is well separated from the high emission. So we we can get much better projections depending on the scenario and can really say how the Arctic anthropogenic carbon uptake will likely change with, uh, with that by if we choose different scenarios. And then we repeated the same for ocean acidification and again found an interesting result or a surprising result, I'd rather say. 
and we see here if we include all drivers the we just have a a, a line a, a horizontal line so there's no correlation anymore between the androgenic carbon uptake or the density and the future saturation state but if we exclude changes in alkalinity we get our old re relationship back which means that in these new models and the new model generation the models that take up a lot uh, or little anthropogenic carbon have strong reductions alkalinity but also create lower saturation state states and this really makes makes the difference so models with a high uptake seem to have low reductions alkalinity models with low uptake seem to have high reduction in alkalinity leading to almost the same degree of ocean acidification and so the question is why does the alkalinity get reduced and one possible driver is uh, freshening, so that we get more fresh water from, from sea ice, from precipitation, minus evaporation, or from rivers. And the other one is biogeochemistry, so different uh, calcification rates with the climate change. And we try to quantify this here. And we basically calculate the freshening by using the changes in, in salinity in the Arctic Ocean. And the biogeochemistry is then just the rest of the, of the remaining change in alkalinity. And we can see that the larger part of the reductions in alkalinity for each model is due to, due to freshening. And this model, it's almost everything. And this one, it's the biogeochemistry does a little bit more on this one. But the main reason for the reduction in alkalinity is the freshening, which basically means that models that freshen a lot reduce their sea surface density and can't take up as much anthropogenic carbon but because they're fresh and they reduce their alkalinity and get more or the conditions get more acidic anyway. So independent really on the mechanism, if it's more freshening and less anthropogenic carbon uptake or more anthropogenic carbon and less, less freshening, we still expect uh, stronger ocean acidification as projected by the constraint estimate of the CMIP-5 models. And then if we look at this, it's actually these constraint estimates of the saturation state of uh, the unconstrained, so just multimodal mean and uh, standard deviation, they almost don't overlap anymore, even without constraining them, which, which came as a big surprise. But as we have now seen, it's not all for the same reasons. So the models still act very differently, but for different reasons, they result in the same degree of ocean acidification, which is, which is really interesting. At least to, to, to me, it was really interesting. And if we go to then just close this chapter, so the take home messages of this part would be that projections of carbon uptake and ocean acidification by climate models in the Arctic Ocean can actually be constrained by maximum sea surface density and hence uncertainties can be reduced. And in CMIP 6 models, the range of uh, uh, projections of Arctic Ocean acidification is reduced even without these constraints due to enhanced freshening, which was uh, was underestimated in previous models. And um, I would have just forgot to say when I showed you the previous graph, in all scenarios, the average Arctic Ocean saturation state of aragonite will be below or just at one. So even if we react very quickly now and follow the, um, the one of the most optimistic uh, socioeconomic scenarios, under saturation towards aragonite is almost unavoidable in the first thousand meters of the Arctic Ocean, based on average. There's of course horizontal differences, especially at the surface, but on average, the the entire water column and the or the first thousand meters will be under saturated, no matter what. Just the degree of under saturation can be changed. And then on the next part, I want to go to the primary production. So and there's. Part, this is part of my PhD. So important is river nutrient delivery and uh, nutrient delivery from coastal erosion. And there, I just want to bring up the graphs that I showed you into the introduction. So that Arctic Ocean primary production is limited to the coastlines and that it has increased lately by a lot. So it's very important to understand how, how, it, how it works and what the main drivers are if we want to judge the projections by, by the Earth system models. And then one process that is not used in climate models is uh, most of the climate models. Now there's, I think, one that does it, 
is uh, the is the delivery of terrigenous nutrients from rivers and coastal erosion, and this is often neglected in global models because um, on a global scale it doesn't really matter. But in the Arctic Ocean it does because well, it's for different reasons because erosion in the Arctic is higher than most parts of the of the world and can reach rates up to twenty five meters per year in the in the most extreme uh, places. And uh, we already know that rivers sustain 10% of the Arctic Ocean NPP, and so the net primary production, and that nutrient fluxes from rivers are projected to increase, and hence uh, likely increase the NPP over time. But these are not, uh, but coastal erosion is not at all accounted for, and uh, system models don't have rivers, uh, nutrient delivery from rivers. So this is probably why we see this large or well, this might be a reason why we see this large difference, because if nutrients are still available, they could go on, but if there are no nutrients coming afterwards, it could go down. So could terrigenous nutrients really explain the divergence? And, um, oh, sorry, this came at the wrong point. This I want to have it earlier. I'm sorry for that. So another reason why rivers are important, this should have come just before, is that 11% of global river discharge goes into the Arctic, and the Arctic only holds 1% of the global ocean volume, so it's much more per volume than in the rest of the ocean. And the Arctic coastline is eroding very fast, and because shelves represent a lot of the, of the area in the Arctic Ocean. So what do we do to answer this question? Now to go to the slide that I wanted, is that we first had to derive Arctic estimates for river and carbon and nutrient fluxes. And this is what we did based on observations from the Arctic Great River Observatory, which only without these observations, we could have never done the study. And that gave us a great help to, to do this. And we used these estimations from the six biggest watersheds and extrapolated these to the entire Arctic Ocean based on catchment characteristics, such as permafrost, or others, and then did a spatial extrapolation and then extrapolated it monthly as well based on just based on the discharge. And how that looks like here, for example, for the month June, you can see here, it's a lot of tiny grid cells where the, where the here nitrogen comes in. And in some places where bigger rivers are, here the Lena comes in or the Op or the Yeni say you have high discharge, but mostly the discharges or the, the fluxes are very low. And we did the same for coastal erosion. So we used uh, observed erosion rates from satellite and organic carbon content in, in this coastal soil and used then the stoichiometric ratios for, for, for nutrients and then calculated the erosion fluxes and divided them seasonally as well. And here you can see fluxes from the coastal erosion for one month. And we you see that the fluxes are more homogeneous and less peak flux is like for the rivers because coastal erosion comes in almost everywhere. And we used this data so then of month of a monthly climatology of uh, fluxes from carbon and nutrient fluxes from rivers and uh, nutrients to, uh, from rivers and coastal erosion to force our simulations. And if you want to use these uh, gridded estimates of these fluxes, the gl uh, gr gridded climatology, you can download it here is the DOI. I think the presentation will be online afterwards. So you can copy it afterwards. And it's, yeah, it's, it's freely available and usable with a citation that's attached to it. And then to look at it in a little bit nicer way than just on a gridded product, we plotted the fluxes of nitrogen. Here's an example on, on the Arctic Ocean. And we see that the river delivery here in blue comes in really where the big rivers come in and there's almost none at least it's not visible at, uh, at most of the other places, but uh, whereas coastal erosion is more a background flux that is almost everywhere, but, uh, but less pronounced in special particular locations. And here you see the supply of the climatology. So for every month, and because of very limited co uh, organic carbon measurements in the coastal soils, the coastal erosion estimates the uncertainties remain remain very large, uh, especially at the peak time from, uh, and uh, st still not, not very certain. A lot of work could be done there and would be very valuable for our, for our studies. And as I said, we used this input then to, 
to drive our ocean biogeochemical model, which is at this point when I say our, it's still for my PhD. So it's the Nemo Piscus model from in France from the IPSL. Here you can see see the grid. And I used it with an historical reanalysis set and at a hor nominal horizontal resolution of uh, for quarter degree, which gives you a grid scale length of 14 kilometers in the Arctic Ocean. So one grid cell is 14 times 14 kilometers on average. Changes a lot depending where you are, but this is just to give you give you an idea what, what, what you can think about of the grid size, which is already quite high for for uh, an ocean biogeochemical model. And what we did then, we did two simulations, one where we included the input from coastal erosion and rivers and one where we excluded it. And the difference then is what we used to quantify the impact of rivers and coastal erosion on, on primary production. And we did this simulation over 20 years, each simulation and analyzed it over the last 10 years, which, we, which are the time from uh, 2002 to th uh, 2003 to 2012 in the historical reanalysis uh, data set. Which is what is important to understand is, I put that here in, uh, in bold letters because I had the problem uh, with already in a talk before, is that when I speak about NPP sustained by terrestrial nutrients, it's really calculated as the difference between the two simulations. So what happens is then is that a nutrient or molecule comes into the Arctic Ocean, can be used in prime, by prime production, can be remineralized later. The organic matter that comes out of it can be remineralized and the nutrient or, or the uh, molecule is back in inorganic form and can be re re reused and reused and reused. Whereas in observations, usually you only or only the nutrients that directly come from the rivers are, are considered. And once they are in the ocean for two or three years and gone through this consumption, remineralization consumption rate, they're not distinguishable anymore from, from ocean nutrients. So this is why numbers can, can differ quite a lot when I speak about terrestrial nutrients, sustained MPP compared to observations sometimes. So then if, when we look at the results of the simulations, we have on the left side here, the NPP and the Arctic Ocean if we include rivers and coastal erosion in the simulations, and we have on the, in the middle the simulation without rivers and coastal erosion, where we see very little primary production on the, on the Siberian shelf, basically, but also reduced primary production where the Mackenzie River comes in, and almost no changes in the Barents Sea opening where the water comes in from the Atlantic, and here in the Chukchi Sea where the water comes in from the Pacific. And then, if we compare that to the database product, and then we see that uh, the comparison to this simulation is much better with the high MPP here. And here we don't get the MPP very high, or well, this might be because water of the Yenisei here that can, this year isn't exported properly. But if we exclude this, uh, these nutrients from, from coastal erosion and rivers, we, we get a very different image really and can't reproduce the database product, which suggests that really not not including these nutrients makes a big difference for, for estimating NPP with the global models. And yet the, this is just to show where the biggest difference lies. And quantitatively, if we divide the Arctic Ocean into different local seas, it's what we did here. So we have the Beaufort Sea, the Chukchi Sea, the East Siberian Sea, Laptev Sea, Kara Sea, and Barents Sea. We calculated the NPP, annual NPP, here for the simulation with terrigenous nutrients without and then this is the observed or the estimated MPP based on observations and we can see that what I just said that small changes are happening in these seas but once we go to the Siberian shelf we see that if we exclude the terrigenous nutrients we don't get close enough uh, close to the to the database estimates or to the observed estimates at all which uh, shows the importance of these terrigenous nutrients. And then the question arises why our numbers, uh, why we get here the, this importance of terrigenous nutrients and before it wasn't, they weren't considered as important. I already somehow came to that point before when I explained how we made the simulations. But 
And just to explain it before, often people looked at the amount of terrigenous supply of nitrogen to the Arctic Ocean by rivers and coastal erosion, which on average, or uh, the best estimate that we get is 2.6 teragrams of nitrogen. But if we look at the difference in primary production that is simulated, we get a difference between the two simulations of 138 teragrams carbon, which uh, represents approximately 21 teragrams of nitrogen, which is eight times larger as the supply. So how is it possible that uh, such a small supply that was often neglected so far can make such a big difference in the primary production? And this is because once the molecule enters the Arctic Ocean shelves, especially the vast Siberian shelves, gets used for primary production, it gets remineralized, it gets reused, remineralized, reused, remineralized, reused. And this happens according to our simulations that represent the database estimates of NPP quite well, about uh, eight times in the Arctic Ocean before, before the molecule is exported off the, out of the Arctic Ocean or buried in the shelf seas. And um, before when the, these model studies weren't available, often the estimates of the recycling rate, which would be seven because it's eight times used, so seven times recycled, were estimated to be between 0 0.5 or 3.2 based on estimates in the Canadian Arctic archipelago. But this seems to be not representative for the high Arctic with the large uh, shelf seas because the depths here in this region are much deeper. And we get much less remineralization in the sediments. And this is why we separated really the remineralization rates in the model that allows us to do so. And in black, you see the simulation uh, estimates of the total of the with uh, nutrients from uh, from rivers and coast erosion and in green you see the difference to the one without we can see that most of the remineralization so most of the difference in remineralization really happens in the sediments and not in the marine or not in the water column or neither by zooplankton grazing and then excretion so you see, you see that sediments are really mostly responsible for this and this makes the big difference to to other regions like the Canadian Arctic archipelago or other recycling rates in the global ocean. So really the, the, these results suggest that the vast shelf seas in the high Arctic really allow for a high remunization rate and thus for a high importance of nutrients that come directly from the coastline into, into the Arctic, into the Arctic Ocean. And if we look on a map of these remunerization rates here on the right, we see that it happens there where the depth really is really shallow, where it's up to 40 meters here. There we find the highest remineralization rates really in the Arctic Ocean, which suggests that this is this makes the terrigenous nutrient input that important. We are well aware that our study has uh, a big large number of caveats, but our model doesn't represent all effects, and that we, for model construction reason, had to assume that all organic nutrients are transformed into inorganic nutrients once they enter the Arctic Ocean because we, uh, because of the number of traces that are available in the model. This is why we, we try to account for all that, which is seen here. It's a rather complicated plot. So what you see on the left side first is the Arctic Ocean NPP uh, color coded. And here's the dot where we, our simulation without any terrigenous nutrients then we made a uh, simulation without coastal erosions. And we have the baseline uh, simulation with the coastal erosion and rivers. And the, this line is the database estimate with the uncertainties. So we, this lies uh, well within this, uh, this NPP. And basically we considered uh, missing sources of uh, nutrients from, from land such as subsea, perma, uh, subsea coastal erosion and others, and this gives us this, uh, uh, this area where considering all the carriers that we could find uh, could, could, possibly, could possibly lie. And so the high range is uh, mainly due to, due to even uh, to subsea sub coastal erosion that uh, presents a potentially large source of additional nutrients. And the lower ranges is if we assume that not all nutrients are, are really disposable as in, in an organic matter are more, and are more refractory at less labor. And here it's uh, 
a percentage of Tarija, uh, how, so how much of the MPP is driven by Tarija is no chance. And we can see here that we end up in this one third somewhere here region and that the minimum that we could estimate based on all the different assumptions would be around 20 to 24 percent so even if we make the most conservative the conservative assumptions we we still can't get something below that and that fits well to to the database estimates as well so the take home messages messages here is that teresia's nutrients are in fact one of the main drivers of arctic ocean npp and that they therefore should be considered in, in ESM projections as well, so Earth system model projections. And um, they're that important because they are recycled on average seven times before leaving the upper Arctic Ocean. And most of this remineralization or recycling happens in the shallow Arctic Ocean sediments. And I can't really say anything on this because we didn't make any study on this. I think I would, this result suggests that Arctic Ocean MPP, the likelihood that it will decline because of too little nutrient availability is very low if indeed a lot of the uh, nutrients that are used for MPP in the Arctic don't come from below the ocean, but from, uh, from, from the side, from the lateral input, then stratification wouldn't actually have an as big input as expected by, by the models so far. So just to sum it up, uh, basically, there are two, two main messages. Ocean acidification is extreme or more extreme than previously expected. And this is not good for the Arctic Ocean ecosystem. And in, in increasing terrestrial nutrients that are expected over time of climate change may lead to a future increase in Arctic Ocean MPP. And this might be actually good because more food will be available for, for the animals and the organisms in the Arctic Ocean. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope uh, I didn't lose you on the way and it was interesting for everyone. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Um, you didn't lose me. <laughs> Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Jens. That was a great presentation. Uh, we're now going to begin our question and answer session. And as a reminder, if you are joining by Zoom, please type your questions into the chat window and then I will read them aloud for everyone to hear. And if you're joining by phone, you'll need to raise your hand by pressing star nine and then unmute yourself or unmute yourself by pressing star six, and then you can ask your question loud. Um, if needed, uh, Dr. Jens Tahar has offered to continue to be available for another five to 10 minutes at the top of the hour. We'll do a soft close at the top of the hour so that people um, can uh, leave information in the uh, survey. Um, but for now, we'll go to uh, the first questions. We have a question from Suzanne Davidson. And she asks, and this was um, at 9.30, so it's just after the first section of your talk, do any of the model scenarios calculate the expected changes on a more granular level? That is, given the Arctic Ocean's vulnerability, what impact does it have that fish farming is concentrated in the northern regions close to the Arctic, which adds up to point of emissions and acidification? Has this sector's potential contribution ever been calculated? Oh, that's a tough question. So many points. So, if on a more granular level, I guess you meaning higher resolution, or really more granular in the way of more more different processes added. Or maybe I can I can try both. So, first on a higher resolution in the new model generation, there are some models that give them higher resolution, two or three, so that would be more or less good enough to get. Uh, so that will be close to what we we used here in our study with the ocean only model, but uh, we didn't see any, at least on the global Arctic, no visible effect on resolution on global scale processes, which doesn't mean that the local processes may, may, may be better simulated, but yeah, I, I really can't answer these questions at the moment, but there's potential now with more computational power and results are there to, to look at that. Concerning fish farming, I actually don't think that it's included in any of the scenarios. But again, I'm not part of the ecologist or economist who do these uh, scenarios. But this, I don't, I can't imagine, I don't see anywhere where this input could come in into these model simulations that are part of the CMAP model. So I don't think that any of this is, is added as a 
potential source of nutrients or loss of nutrients so far. But maybe someone in the audience can can correct me there who knows better. But sorry that I can't can't help you more on this. Okay, um, had another couple of questions come in, um, and the first one is: um, Do the coarse resolution models represent the Arctic Ocean sufficiently well to make these conclusions? Or, in other words, which processes that may influence anthropogenic carbon uptake and ocean acidification in this part of the ocean are still missing? Yeah, this is uh, this is a good question. Uh, I hope that I could answer it at least a little bit when I compared CMOP five to CMOP six, and I think the reason is not only resolution, but to some extent, so definitely low resolution and a completely wrong circulation doesn't reproduce the Arctic sufficiently well to do to make conclusions. But on the other hand, what we find then is that independent on the resolution or whatever uh, process are simulated that really the main uptake happens or the main storage happens via the Barents Sea. And if models even for the wrong reason get this density high, the water goes deep into the Arctic and takes with it the anthropogenic carbon. So this relationship allows us uh, to make these conclusions, even if the processes that lead to the density are the wrong ones, because at least if the density is there, the water goes down and the anthropogenic carbon goes with it to the right place. So the, I think we can make the conclusions, even if the processes are not well simulated. But for me, the bigger, the bigger but comes from missing processes really that are not, for, uh, not necessarily related to, to the resolution. So for example, the freshening, if models don't simulate and most of the models don't do at the moment, simply changes in river and input and the discharge might increase a lot. This might may cause greater, greater freshening and then reduce anthropogenic carbon uptake. As we have, as the results suggest now, that wouldn't affect the new estimates of acidification, but it could estimate the effect of anthropogenic carbon storage in the Arctic Ocean. So these processes should be included. It, the impact now can just be just be guess and guessed and this comes into the uncertainties. But uh, if there are other processes that no one is aware at the moment of, then uh, this could influence it as well. In the Arctic, I can't think about a lot more than freshening from because atmospheric dynamics should be included. Then it's a question for atmospheric models how well they represent expected changes or not. So evaporation and precipitation should be in there. Sea ice loss is in there, so that freshening is there as well. So I guess really it comes down to to what happens yeah, to, to the freshening. And then of course, yeah, there's always the question how well the biogeochemistry work. But I think in this case, the biogeochemistry is of second order compared to the compared to the physics. Thanks. Thank you. Um, another couple of questions, uh, one from Hanji Wang, who says, nice talk. Given the high recycling rate of nitrogen in the Arctic, uh, can I understand the carbon export rate by the biological pump is weak there? Um, so the export rate to the deep ocean is weak in the Arctic. I think there was studies from, if I'm not wrong, from Leif Andersen from, from Göteborg. 10 years ago, he made had that several papers uh, looking at, at the export rate there. And uh, our s simulation suggests that the biggest changes really come from the from the physics. And I think the export is that low because, as I said before, a lot of uh, primary production happens really on the shelves. And it's not only the high recycling rate, but also that the burying or uh, the burial happens also already on the shelves on the 40, 80 meters depth. And there's not, there are not so many nutrients that then make it to, to the open Arctic Ocean where they, and where they can't really co consume so far at least, but in the future maybe by primary production because light is just missing, missing there. But still some organic matter could go out, but uh, yeah, the, uh, the export rate is much lower than in many other parts of the ocean. So that's probably the answer to your, to your question, yeah. Thank you. And then Petra Moody um, asks, I'm a little confused about your definition of the Arctic Ocean. Technically, according to the Oceanographic Convention, it is the oceans to 60 degrees south and include much of Norwegian Sea and includes Hudson Bay. 
uh, for carbon and uh, silica models, you limit area to the Arctic Ocean north of Fram, Nares, and Bering. But for uh, nitrogen models and sediment, you include southern compartments, particularly Canadian Arctic archipelago channels. How do you justify choice of different definitions of the Arctic Ocean? Yeah, that's a good question. And sorry for, for not clarifying that from the beginning on. So when I talked about the Arctic Ocean, I, can I go? And I have to kind of go back somewhere here. Yeah. I'll do one of these maps. So basically, I used uh, this definition. What you can see, uh, see here, all the colored where you don't have the bathymetry below it. So it's limited by the by the Bering Strait, the Bering Sea opening, the Fram Strait, and here the, just the uh, the north, uh, uh, the south of the Canadian Arctic Archipelago. And this is just taking us the high Arctic, and we chose this region because there the deep basins come and uh, start to to be to occurring. And this is the Norwegian seas has a very different different dynamics. So, although some other studies include include these, we we to understand the processes and what really happening, we really concentrated in both studies. So I think there's some confusion from my presentation about which regions were used in both studies. I looked at this region, at these regions for the analysis. But of course, what we did is the input from rivers. We uh, we uh, we put it in, um, in further south, so that the, these inflowing waters already have also rivers from from Norway. So we used inputs from 60 degrees north up uh, northward. And but we analyzed the impacts only in the in the high Arctic. So I should have said it's the high Arctic Ocean and not not the Arctic Ocean. And yeah, I think for our process understanding, it's really it, it's it, it's important to to separate the Norwegian seas from the other from the other regions in the in the Arctic Ocean. Thanks, and then Petra. Um, comes back and she she responded saying so your definition is better said as high arctic which is what you just said exactly. um, and then grant from alaska asks um, have the models included industrial pollution for example petroleum pollution such as north sea offshore prudhoe bay developments theoretical models of potential on offshore oil spills what would be the impact on the nutrient models okay this is 99.9 uh, .9 not part of these models um definitely not the one that i used the ones that were used for the model intercomparison project uh i don't i would to 99.9 percent .9 say it's not in there so what would be the impact if i had to 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 guess i have no idea how such a spill could could interact with the nutrients and how it could affect i think the long-term impacts if, if it happens only rarely now and is stopped in the future, wouldn't be large, but the, on the short term and on the yearly impacts, I'm sorry, but I, I, can't, I can't answer this. We, we don't have oil spills in, in the models now. Okay, thanks. Well, are there any other questions that, that folks have? I, I'm not um, seeing any, and I think maybe we'll go ahead and close at the top of the hour. Um, but if you do have questions, please go ahead and type them in and we'll um, share those with Dr. Tahar um, as, as we close up. Um, so I think next slide, please. We want to thank everyone for joining us today and we extend, of course, a special thanks to our speaker, Dr. Jens Tahar. Today's webinar will be archived and available at a later date at www.arcusorg.org slash research seminar series archive. You can also visit the Arcus homepage for more information about Arcus, our programs and upcoming Arctic related events. Next slide, please. Oh, we continued, we continually work to improve our seminar series and we look for suggestions for future wet seminar topics and speakers. Please do take a minute or two to complete our short survey. A link to that is available now in the chat window. The survey link will also be sent in the follow-up emails that you receive once the seminar has been posted to our archive. Um, with that, I think that on behalf of Arcus, and uh, we want to thank everyone for joining us today. And again, a special thanks to our speaker, Dr. Jens Tahar for his uh, really good presentation. 
We wish everybody a good day. And this concludes our webinar. Thank you so much for joining us.